KRS One, the Golden Age rapper of the Bronx, New York, uh, once said that hip hop is something that you live and rap is something that you do. By a show of hands, how many of you know what hip hop culture is? All right, that's good. Um, keep those hands up if you know how it began, though. All right, that's pretty good too. So. Um, well, this is where I come in. Uh, today I will reviewing in detail the history of the hip hop culture. Um, so why hip hop? Um, I've been listening to hip hop since since my ch early childhood, I'd say. Uh, even before I started going to school, I was uh, acquiring a taste for hip hop music, which was, you know, some uh, for some kind of uh, of the genre's music, somewhat dangerous because of the explicit uh, lyrics, but also good, like listening to other music and also acquiring tastes from older music because of that. Um, but it's not only something in my life, it's also safe to say it's in all of our lives, whether we listen to it or not. Um, for our generation, it's considered widely pop music, like popular culture music. So it's all like all around, regardless of you know if we pay attention to it or not. So I'll describe the beginnings of hip hop in the late 70s, the golden age of hip hop in the 80s and 90s, early 90s, hardcore rap, gangster rap, and G-funk in the 90s, and then concluding with 21st century hip hop and its possible place in the future. So like everything else, hip hop had to begin somewhere. It was founded in the Bronx, New York in the late 1970s by African American and Latino American teens living in poverty. In poverty. It consisted of uh, many products, not just um, the music, but um, the parts of the music it did consist of was DJing and MCing, which um, MCing is rapping, and then b-boying, which is breakdancing, and then one more product of, uh, of hip-hop culture was graffiti, which is vandalism as we see it all today, but it, um, that was what actually kicked off the hip-hop culture, according to EnglishClub.com. Um, so, DJing is using two turntables and a DJ mixer to play records nonstop. And MCing is introducing the DJ and entertaining the crowd by talking in time with the beat and also writing. Um, they would also add, oh wait, DJs and MCs started creating their own music by sampling the music of the time and adding their own style to it. They were only mostly at house parties and block parties, so only live at the time. Um, but one example of this was DJ Cool Herc, um, according to Hip Hop Evolution, widely considered father of modern hip hop. Um, during this time, hip hop was becoming so popular that many began creating groups of DJs and MCs, including Cold Crush Brothers, Fantastic Romantic Five, Funky Four Plus One, and more. Since hip hop was barely finding its basis, it was only done live at the time, and many didn't even want to make hip hop records yet because they were afraid of they were afraid of um, it becoming like how disco was becoming during that time. <laughs> because disco, it was popular, but as you can see, who listens to disco? Um, but one group was influenced to make a hip hop record. Uh, Sylvia Robin Robinson, a singer and founder of Sugar Hill Records, finally put rap on a record. And that group that did that was Sugar Hill Game. 1979, they released their first, uh, the first hip hop single known as Rapper's Delight. Um, and according to English Club, it is also the first hip hop song to make top 10 worldwide. Um, however, there is controversy over the origins of the song. According to Hip Hop Evolution, a documentary on Netflix, um, it is said that the strongest lyrics of Rapper's Delight came from its true author, Grandmaster Kaz of the Cold Crush Brothers. But after Rapper's Delight gained widespread success, many other hip hop albums were being released at this time, including Curtis Blow's The Breaks and African Bambada's Planet Rock. Most of the songs during this time were kind of having the disco feel, which was like partying and having fun. But um, there was one group that broke away from having fun and became an early example of socially conscious hip hop. And that is 
Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five with their song The Message. Um, now, I bet a, a good amount of you know about Check, um, Check Yourself Before You Wreck Yourself by Ice Cube. Um, this is the song they sampled for that. So, um, it talked about social issues at the time, um, including poverty and crime, and also the stress of living in a dangerous city. Um, these, these first pioneers of hip hop set the bar and created a basis of, and created a basis and influenced the next gen generation, um, what is known as the Golden Age. So the Golden Age began in the mid 80s where rappers were creating hip hop singles with catchy hooks. Um, one example of this is a widely known rapper known as Run DMC, which is a rap trio from Queens, um, which they used hooks and hard rock guitar riffs to create their music, which is um, a, new, a genre of hip hop, a subgenre known as rap, rap rock. And it was an, um, they, they, an early example of this genre was their 1986 album, Raising Hell. Another, another group example of the subgenre was um, the Beastie Boys, who, who like, instead of just would speak their raps, they would shout them, and they would, um, they would kind of have a punk, kind of a punk rock mix of hip hop. Um, in the late, oh wait, and that, um, their debut album, License to Ill, also became hip hop's first number one album. In the late 80s, Beats were starting to be made in studios with drum machines, synthesizers, and and samples from other songs, mostly funk, disco, and jazz. One duo to utilize this was Eric B. and, and Rakim, whose paid in full album of 1987 is one of hip-hop's greatest albums. Also in the late 80s, a new style of political and social conscious hip-hop developed with groups such as Public Enemy, um, NWA, and more. These groups demanded po political change and an end to injustice and racism. In the early 90s, producers began using audio editing software and digital effects to create new styles of alternative hip hop, including jazz rap, jazz rap which um, came from groups like the Tribe Called Quest and De La Soul, uh, reggae and soul rap, which came from a group called the Fugees, and female rappers such as Salt, Salt and Peppa and Queen Latifah. The Golden Age rappers helped expand the hip hop culture to different areas around the nation, which influenced the creation of hardcore rap, uh, gangster rap, and G-Funk. These were the most successful genres of the 90s, with hardcore rap coming from New York and gangster rap and G-Funk coming from Los Angeles, the California area. So one of the first hardcore rappers was the group Wu-Tang Clan, who rapped about gangster life over hip hop beats with samples from martial, uh, martial arts movies. And this is their um, most popular album, Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers, which came out in 1992. Another rapper of the hardcore genre is um, Nas, who released Illmatic back in 1994, which had loose mid-tempo beats, jazz samples, and his great poetic rapping. It is also one of the subgenre's greatest albums, along with the 1994 album Ready to Die by the Notorious B.I.G. So gangster rap developed from this, but it also developed from golden age rappers such as the NWA and Ice-T, um, who would rap about dangers of drugs, crime, dropping out of school, injustice, and police violate, uh, violence in the neighborhoods of LA. Um, most of these, most of these uh, songs and their albums consisted of explicit language, so a lot of that um, had to do with the creation of the parental advisory sticker being made. Well, which is, um, if there's like any kind of bad word on a, on a, on the album, there's going to be a sticker that says parental advisory is, or parental, parental, parental permission is advised or something like that. So um, NWA's leading members, Ice Cube, EZ, and Dr. Dre, broke away from the group to launch their solo careers as gangster rappers during this time as well. Other rappers of the gangster rap uh, genre included Tupac, Cypress Hill, and Too Short. G Funk was heard for the first time in Dr. Dre's 1992 album, The Chronic. Uh, G Funk producers often, often sampled groups by George Clinton P Funk groups such as Parliament and Funkadelic, and slowed them down to create relaxed beats 
with funky bass lines, electronic, uh, electronic effects, and sometimes female backing vocals. G-Fuckers also rapped about gangster rap, um, gangster rap topics, but they mostly focused on partying, sex, and drugs. Um, some well-known G-Funkers are Warren G, Snoop Dogg, DJ Quick, and more. All of these kinds of subgenre rappers often ad adopted gangster, gangster images and explicit language. The way they rapped about women upset many people during this time. But to others, especially teenage boys, they became the sound of mainstream hip, mainstream hip hop. And um, these subgenres remained in the mainstream until up until the 21st century. So in the 21st century, hip hop became a major genre of pop music. It, it solidified its standing as the dominant influence of global youth culture and hip hop singles and albums were topping charts worldwide. But also during this time, the music in industry was going through a crisis started by the advent of digital download. Hip hop suffered just as severely, if not just as much, as the other genres, with sales tumbling throughout the decade. Hip hop's creative center was now in the American South, which included rappers from um, Usher, Ludacris, and T.I. from Atlanta, 36 Mafia from Memphis, um, Bun B from Texas, Lil Wayne from, uh, and Lil Wayne from New Orleans. Not only that, but hip-hop scenes in countries from all over the world developed, um, giving us rappers like M.I.A. and Dizzy Rascal from the U.K. and Drake from Canada. Dr. Dre was still a crucial figure in hip-hop culture during this time, um, including signing 50 Cent and Eminem. However, he wasn't releasing any music up until around 2010, which made, which made him lose much of the, uh, uh, which made his LA style much, move, lose much of its power. Other pop music of 21st century started including elements of hip-hop and even had rappers and pop stars collaborating with each other. An example of this is a um, popular song See You Again by pop singer Charlie Puth and rapper Wiz Khalifa, which topped charts in 96 countries in 2015. And one of, uh, well, considered to be one of hip hop's most influential rappers and producers, and uh, crucial as well, is Kanye West, which he began his career with his debut album, The College Dropout, in 2004. Ever since then, he's been expanding the genre by developing a number of different styles, including electro rap and gospel hip hop. Although he is seen as very influential, um, Kanye's endless self promotion and arrogant vibe has, of recent, been testing the patience of his fans. Um, since 2010, new styles of hip hop and underground rap have been um, coming up, have been coming up um, together, such as trap and um, revival, which is the revival of um, basically the other subgenres of the of different times. Um, and they have been created by independent artists who began career, careers by releasing free mixtapes on social media websites such as Twitter, Facebook, um, sometimes Instagram, stuff like that, and even SoundCloud. That's become wi um, a widely known website where up-and-comer up um, producers and rappers will release their stuff. Um, an example of this would be Old Sweatshirt's Doris, Kendrick Lamar's To Pimple Butterfly, and um, personally my favorite, Joey Badass's 1999 mixtape, which, um, which was nominated for a BT, BET Music Award when it first came out in 2012. So hip-hop culture has come a long way, from beginning at house parties with turntable DJs and MCs, to finally being put on record, to even finally filling up arenas around the world. Using audio editing software from, for the music and the rapper to tell the story. Hip hop, although sometimes seen as copying other musicians by sampling their songs, is also its own genre and music, um, its own genre of music and art form. Anyone who tells you otherwise doesn't truly know about the impact, impact hip, -hop, hip hop culture has had on the American society. Thank you for listening. Erica, what did you think? I thought it was 
speech was pretty good. He had a uh, various amount of examples for every era he was talking about. Um, it was pretty descriptive, too. And he did point out a lot of uh, sightings, like or, um, on websites and stuff. Uh, what I noticed was that he messed up twice and he made it noticeable because he would say, oh, wait. And there was a lot of parts where he would um, rush brush his reading, he'd be, really, he'd be speaking really quick, and then there's some parts where he'd go at regular speed, so he should like be cautious of that. And then um, he would read off the cards frequently, and I felt like his speech was too long, to the point where like people start losing interest in it. Well, it's hard to keep an interest in something for a long period of time. I, believe me, I know. <laughs> you know, you do the best you can. Uh, and you have to be a lot more engaged when you're doing something like that because you stand in the one spot and you you keep going to your notes and it, everything sounds like it's well written. It sounds a little bit like it is a, uh, a well well put together essay. But the problem is it does sound a lot like an essay and a little bit less like a speech than you want it to. And when she mentioned uh, the time thing, that's the first thing I'm going to jump on you about. 14 minutes and 37 seconds. So basically, it's twice as long as it's supposed to be. And uh, now I need a heavy cudgel to hit you with. <laughs> you know, something I can pound you over the head with. Just beat me with you the know, camera. Yeah. You know, well, I, I let it go a little bit because we don't have a whole bunch of other speakers that we're jumping in here. And it always feels awkward to cut people off. Uh, but uh, there will be consequences that you have to do, and you need to you need to edit definitely. You need to edit. You're, yeah, no. you're trying to be it in way too much information. It might have been better if you just talked about uh, the uh, the origination. You just stuck with that first period of time and uh, told us a little bit more about uh, you know how the street culture created rap, how it got transformed into a broader cultural issue. Uh, maybe a little bit about uh, you know, emceeing and DJing and all those kinds of things and give us some background there instead of trying to give us the entire history of hip-hop culture for the last 35 years. That's just, uh, that's too much to do yeah. when you have to, you know, you're, you're I don't want to say name every artist, but you're naming a lot of major artists, you're telling us about their particular works, it just... It's too much, and so it needs too to be. Detailed. Yeah, well, it's, it's not just too detailed. There's a lot of times when it's just like, and then there's this, and then there's this, and then there's this. That's not. The, there's not a lot of detail. It's just a list. And then sometimes you did get into details about some things where you're going to talk about a lot of other kinds of things. The visual material is not particularly interesting. I mean, to be honest, it's occasionally we get some pictures of the groups and at best that helps as a transition from one point to another but it doesn't do much to help us understand to me the idea of how the music is sampled how the lyrics have changed how the beats are different how uh, like you're mentioning the different kinds of styles and subgenres that you're talking about I'm wondering, well, why am I not hearing, I mean, some of it I'm glad that we're not hearing, uh, <laughs> but why am I not hearing some samples or examples about how the, how the sound is different, how they emphasize something different? I'm sure that you could find some lyrically appropriate material in each of those subgenres that would be oh, okay. Uh, you know, some of it, I think, you know, definitely would be probably inappropriate for the classroom experience. But uh, a lot of it could easily be illustrating the, the, the sound and the rhythm and the beat thing that you're talking about and how that's different. Con contrasting, for instance, the one subgenre where they slow down the funk music to get a particular effect. That, what do you mean slowing it down? How does it work? And you know, what does that sound like? And for people who know, they're all, they don't need to have it explained. But for people who don't know, which is who your speech is supposed to be designed for, they could really use that a little bit. All right, so I just, like I said, you're, 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 you've got a, a big plate and you've overfilled it. Yeah. All right, and I'm going to stop talking because everybody wants to go, I can tell. <laughs> All right, thank you.